So I, before we get started, I want to um, take something back that I said in a video recently about you. I said that I thought you were probably lying about 90% of what you said. Hmm. And with the, um, with the call that, uh, that Sean sent me from your website, uh, it's like in three, four parts with Dustin Seeger. Right. Um, I, I realized when I listened to that, because I hadn't heard anything like that before, like an extended multiple conversations that you had with people. I've only ever heard short like interactions that you've had. Um, I, I'd like to take back what I said because it, like, like I told them in the hangout the other night that it's obvious you guys do care about people. Um, you wouldn't do what you do if you don't. Um, so I'd, I'd like to take that back. I don't think you're lying about what you say. Um, you reduced the 90% down to about 10%, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, who knows what the actual percent is that any of us lie, but it, uh, I, I, I don't think that was a fair thing for me to say, so I, I apologize for that. I appreciate that. Well, the thing is, I think you have to keep in mind, too, is that a lot of the interaction I have is with the head of, of, of atheist shows, you know, that, and um, really my discussion with those people would be different over a cup of coffee, like with this kid. This kid was very open, and he just wanted to have this talk, and it was, uh, it was very enjoyable. And he was not out there promoting and trying to um, sell his atheism to, to the masses. He was just interested in having a discussion. And to this day, as far as I know, he's still not a, a Christian. Um, but it was a very good discussion. And like I say, most of the people that I engage are the proponents of atheism. And if that is the case, and if it's on a public forum, then I'm going to challenge them. I'm going to challenge their presuppositions, and it's going to be different. And that's one of the reasons that, because I didn't know uh, um, who Sean was talking about when he said somebody wanted to talk with me. If I knew it was you, I probably wouldn't have done it. Because I saw that you have a show on the New Covenant group, The Elephant in the Room. Yes. And um, my thing with the New Covenant group, they have, like, I really don't care because I expect that kind of treatment. But since my time on the show, they have slandered me. They've said things that were false about me. They've never invited me back. They might have said they've invited me back. They never invite me back. Not that I would go anyways. But, um, so, you know, and the association with New Covenant Group, I would just uh, just forget about it. Uh, like Christopher Malti, for instance. But Christopher Malti, he seems like a really decent fellow. Don't know how far I would trust him, but um, he challenged, he asked me on one of the forums on Facebook, and he said he wanted to, well, he was saying something like, are you saying that presupposition, that Christianity is true because of all the other worldviews are false? I said, that's not at all what we're saying. That's a logical fallacy. Now, there might be some presuppositionists who say that, who say that incorrectly. I said, we're not saying that, that Christianity is true because the other ones fail. We're saying Christianity is true and the other ones fail. And I clarified, and he said, well, you need to come on my show and tell this to people because this is what people need to hear about your worldview. And I said, you know, here's the problem. When somebody says that they don't believe in God, they're actually calling God a liar. Because in his word, he says that everybody believes in God. And it's not that I'm a mind reader, because I have no idea what's going on in your head. But that's what scripture says. So when somebody comes along and says, well, I really don't believe in God, let's talk about the finer issues of theism as well and presuppositionalism. I liken that to somebody coming up and saying, you know, I think your wife is a whore. I'm not going to talk about the finer points of marriage with that person. Right. I'm, I'm going to say, hang on a second. I'm going to say, you know, I could, ex I could try and evidentially defend, you know, I'm single, but I could evidentially defend the sanctity of my wife, but I wouldn't do it. And, you know, but the thing is, if somebody wants to come with an honest discussion like you're doing here and at a, over a coffee shop, you know, then I'm fine with that. You know, and I'll, and I'll talk about anything that you would like to talk about. And even with those guys, I would sit down over a coffee with them and talk about these things. And I would be a lot looser with holding people's feet to the fire in a discussion like this than I would in a public forum when their whole idea, and I've heard it said from people in the New Covenant group, is to expose the weak underbelly of presuppositionalism so that people know how to argue with these people. And frankly, I'm not even interested in that. I could care less if I do another debate for the rest of my life. I just want to speak the I truth because I'm concerned. I debates are productive. Yeah, I, the thing is, I'm just concerned. I do this because I'm concerned for people's souls. You that's know? what I realized, and that's why I took back what I said, is because the concern that you have is just not something from my worldview that, that I relate to as something that uh, is a threat to be that concerned about someone. But I understand when I, when I look at your worldview that it is, and that's where you're coming from. So yeah. I, I get that. I get that. Um, I, I'd like to ask you a question about Christianity itself. Sure. 
Now, uh, right. and before right. we, sorry, before you go on, with that said, people in churches were playing the Aaron Ra video, where he was saying, you know, if you believe what you what you believe is true, you should be out of uh, evangelizing people, and Christians put this up in their churches. And I said, you know what that's like? He's saying, you know, if you believe in Santa Claus, you should put milk and cookies out for him. If you believe in the tooth fairy, you should put teeth under the pillow. You know, it's a mockery in a, in a backhanded kind of way. If what you believe is true, you should be doing this. You know, and that's why I'm saying that we don't need someone like Aaron Roth to be in a church. What he says is absolutely true. If you believe it, you should be out evangelizing. But we don't need to take that from somebody like that. Because, I mean, he's a, he's a magician by trade. And you never know um, what kind of backhanded thing he's trying to get into church. Because at the end he says, of course, you know, God doesn't exist. So I, I'm, I'm happy to answer your questions, but... Um, well, let's see how it goes. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I w I've been doing research into the, the, the doctrines of Christianity. Right. Not just um, uh, Protestantism, mm -hmm. but what, what all of them mean. You know, what, what all of the different manifestations around the world of Christianity, what they believe. And I, I, I wrote down a short list of the, the shared doctrines of what it seems like everyone that is a Christian believes. Okay, and before we go on, keep in mind, I'm a factory worker. I was working in a boiler room. I'm a factory worker. I was working in a boiler room six years ago. I will do my best to explain if I have an answer. If I don't have an answer, I'll just tell you that. But, uh, you know, I'm a factory worker. I'm not a theologian. So I'll try no, my best to answer. Fine. I'm no theologian either. Okay, I, great. I, I have a one little degree that's not even related to philosophy or anything like that. It's, it's computer-related, so I'm, I'm just a guy. Well, one of my favorite quotes is that, a person calling themselves a theologian is like a dung beetle calling himself a humanologist. You know, so uh, I'll, I'll do my best and then we'll just go from there. Okay. All right. I want to see if this, you consider this accurate for mm -hmm. how to define Christianity itself. Uh, the core doctrines, and these are, think, I've combined them a little bit into shorter sentences rather than a long list. Uh, there is only one God which exists as a trinity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus was born of a virgin and resurrected, thus providing salvation. And he is the only way to salvation through the doctrine of grace. Those seem to be the core doctrines of Christianity that no matter what denomination or sect people are a part of, that's what they recognize as Christianity. That's what it means to them when, you know, that agrees with everyone else, basically. So would you agree with that? I would, I would say that there are people who call themselves Christians that don't agree with those tenets, and there are some who say they agree with those tenets but really don't. Like, for instance, Roman Catholics would not be considered Christians under those tenets because they believe in salvation by faith plus works. You know, so some, uh, some Roman Catholics identify themselves as Christians, others don't. I would not because of that tenet. In the Council of Trent, Canon 9, it actually says, if you believe in salvation by faith in Christ alone, you're cursed. You're anathema. Council of Trent, Canon 9. So I have Roman Catholics come up to me when I'm on the street and they thank me for what I'm doing. And I said, you know, I really appreciate your thanking me. But you realize that your church teaches that I'm cursed for what I believe. And the problem is if you believe in salvation by faith in Jesus Christ plus works, plus something else, then you're cursed. Because that's a different gospel. So, you know, like I say, I would say, I would agree with you that those are the basic tenets of Christianity. Some who adhere to Christianity might even say, like, I mean, the, the Roman Catholic might even agree with those but their doctrines are contrary to what those things say. Okay, that's fair enough. Um, my, my issue, my issue is not with Christianity. Mm -hmm. I have no problem with Christianity itself. I, I, I think that, that it's very fulfilling for some people. Okay, and, let, let me stop. I don't want to keep cutting. If you want me to not cut you off, no, that's fine, then I'll let you. But the thing is fulfilling. Okay. This is a two-way conversation. Right. It's, not, it's not an interrogation. Okay. So, Fulfilling has nothing to do with it. I'm not a Christian because it's fulfilling. I could give a rip if it was fulfilling. It happens to be, but that has nothing to do with my Christianity. I'm a okay, Christian I wasn't, because... I wasn't yeah. specifically talking no, about No, I realize that. that. But I'm a Christian because it's true. Okay. All right. That's fair enough. Mm -hmm. And I, I would say, and it sounded to me like some of the things I've heard you say, that some people do um, exercise... Christianity being part of the culture because it is fulfilling because they do find it satisfying or they enjoy the feeling of it You would you say that's a fair statement that some people not you do that? Well, I would say um, I, I, I'll tell you a story my friend Dustin He was out very, very first time I ever did anything out on the street and he was talking about hell and this atheist came up to him and He's incensed. He says are you trying to tell me 
that most of the people in this world are going to hell? And Dustin said to him, Sir, I think most people in church are going to hell. And it floored him. And I, I think that that's probably accurate. So there are a lot of people that call themselves Christians that aren't. There are a lot of people that are Christians for the wrong reasons. There are a lot of people that have not submitted their lives and their will to Jesus Christ. They're just Christians by name, maybe because of upbringing or, or whatever reason, but they're still the authority over their own life. And they actually... See, because I think one thing that atheism has done is it has gotten Christians to profess something that they don't believe. Because Christianity talks about a certainty of God's existence. And like I say in my talks, we'll say in church one day, nothing could separate me from the love of the Father. Tears streaming down our face, and then we'll go out into the world the next day. Say, you know, I could be wrong. But if I'm wrong, I die rotten the ground, worms eat my body. They give them Pascal's wager. That's talking about a probability. Now, I understand that there are some genuine Christians, because I used to do that too. I used to use that argument. And I think I was a Christian. However, the world has duped us into defending something we don't even believe. Defending a probability. Now, are those people who view God as a probability? Yes. Are they Christians? I'm doubtful. And this is the question I ask. I said, what if I said to you, I had a wonderful, loving relationship with my wife. I'm just not sure that she exists. You would have every right to question my relationship, if not my sanity. You know, so there are a lot of people who profess something that isn't even Christianity. And it's reflected in their lives as well. Now, I'm not saying that all Christians are saints. I, I wouldn't want you to follow me around. But... The thing is, there are people who clearly profess Christianity, and there is no evidence of that in their lives. And I'm, I'm suspect of their Christianity. The thing is, are they not Christians? I don't know. They might throw themselves on their knees every night and, and cry out to God for forgiveness because they've been a jerk that day. I don't know. I have no idea. But I think I would not be surprised that many who profess Christianity aren't Christians. Well, that's, that's quite the problem, then. If no kidding. people who are not Christians are going to hell, and a lot of the people who think they are Christians are also going to help. That's quite a problem. Well, it's not a problem. It's a problem it's to a problem them. them. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I do what I do. That's it's why a I quit. For all the people who are wrong. That's why I quit a, a very good job six years ago to do this full time. Now, there are people, I mean, in your circles that write my name with a dollar sign on it, as if I'm out for the money. I was making all kinds of money when I was working as a stationary engineer. I make next to nothing doing this. So I do this to try and expose that kind of hypocrisy in Christianity. And, you know, because there's a lot of people, like, let's face it, there's a lot of Christians that are maybe weak in their faith. But what a weak faith is, I don't even know. But they say that they don't want to go to a certain atheist YouTube video because it will shake them. And now they understand a biblical defense of the faith, and they go there... And, and, they're, and they're bold and they're, they're confident, sometimes too much, you know, because sometimes they want to return the favor for being beaten down all their lives and, and try and beat down the atheists, which, you know, I think is, is terrible. But they become emboldened in their faith because now they're defending what they actually believe instead of what the world wants them to believe. Because if you defend the probability, you're welcome at parties. Yeah, I could be right. You know, you could be right. I don't know, it just, you know, makes my life better. Then you're welcome at a party. But if you go to a party and say, you need to repent and put your trust in Jesus Christ or you're going to hell, then you're not welcome anymore, because then you're proclaiming a certainty. And people want to be welcome at parties, so they profess something they don't believe, or they're not really Christians. I don't know. I have to say, completely bluntly, mm -hmm. that I don't think that the apologetic is effective. Well, okay. And that I guess that presupposes for me that I understand what you're intending. Right, with. exactly. So maybe you, at this point, it would be best for you to explain what the intent of the apologetic is. You know, somebody could go up to Jeremiah, you know, from the Old Testament, and say, Jeremiah, I don't think what you're doing is very effective. Jeremiah has a book in the Bible. Now, some people say he saw two converts. From my reading of it, I say he saw no converts. I don't know which converts he saw. You know, I'd have to read the text more closely to see where they get the two converts. Somebody would say to Jeremiah, what you're doing is ineffective. But what I do has nothing to do with effect, because the effect is out of my hands. Because, you know, as the saying goes, the same sun that melts wax hardens clay. All I'm doing is speaking the truth, hopefully in love. And sometimes, you know, I need to be corrected on that. But I'm speaking the truth in love, and the effect is not up to me at all. So if I talk to somebody and they get upset with me, and they say, you've made me more of an atheist than before I started this conversation, sometimes it's their last gasp to try and hurt me. And I say, that's exactly what Scripture says. The words of Christ will be to some an, an odor of life unto life, and to others an odor of death unto death. 
and it's out of my hands as to what that effect will be. But according to scripture, there's such things as goats and there's sheep. And goats and sheep. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. It does not say goats become sheep. So the thing is, I might be talking to goats with every conversation that you've heard. The problem is you don't know that and I don't know that. We're commanded, you know, we treat everybody as a sheep because Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. If that's you today, I don't know. You could be a goat. Now people say, well, then what's the point of it all? I think I'm a goat. Well, you don't know that either. If you ask the Apostle Paul when he was watching the cloaks when they were stoning Stephen, he probably would have said he thought he was a goat. He wrote most of the New Testament. So I have no idea. I have no idea what the status of your heart is right now. The yeah. fact that you've come here, maybe, you know, it's a sincere question. Maybe you're looking for the soft underbelly of presuppositionalists uh, so that you can go on your show and tell people. I don't know what your motive is. But right. I, think, I don't know if God is working in you. I don't know that. But well, so well, my... my well, yeah. Yeah, okay, my motive is just to speak the truth in love, and the effect has nothing to do with me. Because the thing is, do you know what would be effective if I went up to you with a gun in my hand, and I said, convert or die? That would be effective. That's what they did during the Crusades. It would be effective, but it would be wrong. You know, so I don't care about the effect, because this is the example I give. I said, let's say you went to a church, and they did an altar call, which I disagree with anyways. And... Um, 50 people got up and gave their lives to the Lord. They go to the front of the church. And one guy was kind of waffling. And he says, you know, there's a movement going on. There's something going on here. I'm going up. I'm going to give my life to the Lord too. A week later, he finds that those 50 people were paid actors. Now, is he genuinely saved? Possibly. Does the end justify the means? Absolutely not. It was still wicked what they did by hiring people to dupe this person. Was it effective? Yes. Was it right? No. So... Even if the wrong apologetic methodology is the most effective on the surface, I'm going to do what is according to Scripture. All right. Um, look, I'm going to lay out briefly my objection All right. to your apologetic. All right. Um, I've been a non-believer my entire life. There was never a period when I was a Christian except, uh, I guess, never. So right. I'm just going to state that. Well, out. I agree with I'm that. I would agree with that for logical reasons, and I can explain those later if you like. But somebody okay. cannot be well, a Christian. Let me just continue yeah, on that, because mm -hmm. I, I, we're just going to agree on that. No I've problem. Never been a Christian, yeah. even if I had spent any period of time in my life, which I haven't, right. as a Christian, then I, you know, I understand your your theology enough from what you've said that if I'm not not a Christian now, then I never was. Right. I understand that. Okay. Um, but. The, the apologetic seems to me structured in a way that gets people to run around in a circle inside their own worldview, their own understanding of reasoning, to show them that they are flawed and not capable of counting, accounting for it, and it reduces to circularity. I get that. Yeah. That is, to me, a problem for any human... Um, rationalization. So your answer is that you have revelation from God. That general, sorry, specific general revelation is what everyone is provided with within your worldview. Right. Now, for me to understand that, for me to accept that as true, rationally, I, I need to connect the dots. Now, right. that doesn't mean, I also understand within your theology that the only person that can make that clear is God right? within his plan. But I have to be receptive and try to figure it out. I have to be trying to find out what's true rationally to have some sort of a grasp on it in the way that you guys do. So right. I think that in, in that sense, when you approach it, approach non-believers from the perspective of trying to show that their reasoning is is invalid. It's going to to be based on the invalidity, like what you're saying. We're not able to do. Right. But I think that where the, the hinge point is of that is what you're saying we should be able to do versus what we see that we are incapable or capable of doing. So if you're saying we should be able to do something and we don't see a way to get to doing that from our worldview, 
that doesn't mean we're wrong. I mean, sorry, that doesn't mean that you're wrong in saying that you do have a revelation. It's, it's that we don't see how to do that, how to get to that. And when you build your whole life on your own understanding of rationality, circular or not, flawed or not, there appear to be limitations that you just learn to accept, to live with. So to be able to rise above those limitations, as you say you can do, and as you say we could do if we accept God, then we need to figure out within our worldview how to do that. Some people are going to be effective at it, some people are not. Some people are going to be able to reach the understanding that you're talking about. And as I understand, your friend Dustin Seegers is uh, a, a Calvinist like yourself. He's, he's uh, someone that you highly respect based on right. what I've heard. So he was able to get there, but some of us aren't. And the explanation that you seem to provide for that is that it is based on our suppression of sin. Well, um, what, just clarify for me what you mean by Dustin was able to get there. Well, it, it's, I thought I remembered you saying that he was originally a non-believer. Right. And now he's, he's, he's a Christian. Right. So he was able to get there. He was well, able no. to reach there. See, that, that's, that's the misunderstanding. He was not okay. able to get there. God opened his eyes. See, because God is not the end of a philosophical argument. He's not the end of all of these evidences or whatever. And that's pe what people misunderstand about presuppositionalism. God is not the end of the argument. He's a necessary starting point. So really what it boils down to is that we make a claim. God is a necessary foundation, the precondition for intelligibility. That is the claim. And the proof of the claim is the reduction to absurdity of anybody who denies it. All right. So let's go with that. Okay. And, but let me get back to Dustin. So Dustin... Okay. He read the Bible for a year as an atheist. Read it for a year as an atheist. And cried out for repentance, asked God to change his heart. And at one time when he was reading John chapter 3, actually not 16, it was prior to that. That's when God opened his eyes, when he was reading. I don't know how many times he read that passage over and over again. And he didn't reason to the conclusion of God. God finally took the scales off his eyes. He cried out, and in that in that discussion, it's probably one of my favorite ones, the one with that young man when uh, Dustin is talking with him. It's probably my favorite discussion of all time because he really opened up his heart. But he, and I think the fellow asked, "Well, how how long do I repent?" And he says, "Until the day you die, and God cast your soul into hell, or until the day He saves you." You know, and that's what Dustin did as an atheist. Now, of course, Scripture says that God will cast no one out who cries out to Him if they do that in sincerity. And even in order to do that, that's a gift. So it's not something that Dustin arrived at. It's something that he knows, but it will also explain, you know, that God is the one who opened his eyes, and now he can explain the rationality behind it, but he did not reason to Christianity. Now, will God use your reason and my reason in the process? Sure. But it's not that he reasoned autonomously to the conclusion that, you know, Jesus Christ is his Lord and Savior. That's impossible. Okay. I, I understand that as well. I just I, that was poor wording. No, no, that's uh, fine. Just just to clarify that. All right. Um, so then we're, we're at the point of the reduction to absurdity of the contrary of the, the biblical God being true. Right. And that is sort of the answer that Sean has given me to the same question when I asked it of him. Now keep in mind so, though that is not the reason that Christianity is true. No, I understand. Okay. I understand. God I'm, reveals I'm, the truth of it to everybody. So, so when people make the mistake, they're saying that presuppositionalism says that therefore God exists. No, we start with the existence of God, and all other worldviews are reduced to absurdity by necessity. All right. The, the problem that I have, though, with mm -hmm. that is that you stated in that conversation you had, you know, the four videos that I ended or the, the yeah. four audio tracks that I ended up listening to, your friend, I think you said. Mm -hmm. um, you stated at the end that you've never been a non-believer. Right. And that you can't fathom a world without God in it. Right. So I, I, would, I would also argue that nobody has ever been a non-believer. But I also right. don't recall a time when I did not profess Jesus as Lord. But okay. I would say that the non-believer thing, that that actually does not exist. Okay. I, I understand that you believe mm -hmm. that. Right. And I, I, and I believe that that's, that's wrong. And the, the, the reason that I justify that is that you, you said you've never been a non-believer, you've never right. held that position, so you're not, not able to fathom it, and 
in that way, for someone who does hold the position, we're able to see it in a context that you aren't. Okay, but here's the problem, though. My view on that has nothing to do with what I feel. My view on that has to do with what Scripture says. And I'll give you an example. There's, I do it in my talks, actually. There's a fellow named Jerry Johnson. And he was talking about an argument he had with somebody who opposed his view. It was a Calvinist Arminian thing, but that was not really the, the point of what I, was, what I gleaned from this conversation. But he said to this fellow, he said, before you were a Christian, did you seek after God? And the guy says, yes, I think I did. And uh, Jerry Johnson said, you know, I think I did too. And he said, let's go to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3 says, no one understands, no one seeks God. He says, you know what that says? That even our own feelings about what we perceive prior to us being Christians, that we sought after God, are necessarily false because of what Scripture says. So my view on this has nothing to do with my personal feelings on it. It has nothing to do with the fact that I never found a time when I didn't profess Christ. Now, there are differing views on it as to how far that truth can be suppressed. And I think that came out in that conversation with that young man, with Dustin. Because, I was going to ask you about that as well. Right, because Dustin, he will take more of a view where people can suppress it to such a degree where they no longer know. And because he's been in that position. Whether, you know, I don't know where, whether Dustin feels that there was a time when he actually did not know, but one thing he said, it's a culpable suppression of the truth. That they're responsible for pushing it that far away. I do not understand that it can be pushed that far away. But now, Dustin might come on here and say, well, I think that people can push it. But if you, leave, if you read further in Romans uh, chapter 1, it says that these people are God-haters, although they know his righteous decrees. So these are things that people still know about God, even if they pushed it to such a degree. So in some degree, there is an inkling of knowledge of God, and it's a culpable suppression, so that when this person stands before God, it's not going to be a, oh, well, what do you know? There is a God. And when somebody becomes a Christian, when Dustin became a Christian, it wasn't a matter of, oh, wow, you do exist. People do not go from unbelief to belief. They go from suppressing the truth to professing the truth. I just find it hard to believe that people have pushed it so far away as to call themselves unbeliever. And like, like I said, we differ in those camps. However, if it is the case that people have pushed it so far away to call themselves unbeliever, it's a culpable suppression of the truth. It's an active suppression of the truth that they've done throughout their lives. You know, so what, what argument would you give to someone who had pushed it that deeply that they were wrong? Romans 1. I don't argue that. I cannot argue that. I can only say what God says. Okay. And if, if they pushed it that deeply, then what you say and what the Bible says are not going to resonate with the truth that they do with you. No. No, the thing is, Romans 1 says that people who say there is no God, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, have suppressed the truth and unrighteousness. The degree... What about the people who don't say that there's no God, they just don't believe that one does exist? That, that means that since you say that knowledge is a justified true belief, right. then, it, then it is a form of belief. Knowledge that is justified and true, that's, that's true. But to form that belief requires for you to arrive at the, the conclusion that this is part of reality. This is, this is something that cannot be denied. Right. This so is where I'm not denying. I have not, re, re, I have not reached the point where I consider that a true statement, nor have I, re, have I come to the conclusion that it's a true statement that God does not right. exist. But I'm not even so saying I'm, that. That's where I am. Yeah, I'm not even saying that, though. I'm not saying that... Uh, and I never, I, I never ask atheists or professed atheists to prove that there is no God. I don't care how people define their atheism. They just say, I lack belief. And that by, might be, and I think that is encompassed in Romans 1, by the way. But when somebody says they, just make a, they don't make a positive claim that there is no God, they just say, I lack belief. I haven't been shown the evidence. I haven't been convinced of it. I say, but here's the problem with that. Accompanied with the claim that I just lack belief is associated with a positive claim that I can know things without God, that I can have truth without God, that I can trust my sense experience without God. And these are all things that you do, and all people who profess not to believe in God do. And I say that exposes the fact that they really do believe in God, because they cannot justify any of those things according to their worldview. That depends on the, just, the level of justification you're talking about. I'm saying within we can't... Within our worldview, we can justify it, just it doesn't satisfy you within no. our worldview. It's, well, the thing is, you could say... Thing. You could say, I justify it by, um, you know, eating a banana. It's just sufficient justification for me. I ate a banana, therefore, you know, I can have truth, I can have knowledge. And I say, well, look, if that satisfies you, I can't help, I can't help that. 
But the thing is, the satisfaction that it's not about a, a feeling of satisfaction for you know the foundation of their worldview. It's whether it's sound, whether it's a sound justification. And clearly, you know, I'm, I'm interested. I'm all ears. If somebody says they have a sound justification for these things apart from God, I'm all ears. I've been doing this for almost six years now when I quit my job full-time, and I've asked people for that. And what I do... I have a straight answer for you. Okay. I have a straight answer. In the same way that you say that you can't reason us to God. Right. That it's, it, it's going to happen within God's plan to you. It, as far as you can tell, you, you can only speak what you know to be true and hope that someone will hear you and reach them in that way. Right? Well, not that somebody that, will hear me, that, that God will use those words. He can, he can save uh, people totally without me. He can do that, but he uses people like me in that process. But that's up to God. He could use Benny Hinn, for all I know. You know, mm -hmm. a wicked, false teacher like Benny Hinn, he could use to save people. God can strike a straight blow with a bent stick. But anyhow, go on. So I, I think I know where you're going up, but continue. No, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be interested to hear what, you're, what you think, where you think I'm going. Um, that you're saying that just as like I'm saying that you need certain revelation to see my view, that I need some kind of event or whatever to, to be able to see and understand and accept your justification. Something along that line. That, that's, uh, that, that works. That, that wasn't exactly where I was going, um, mm -hmm. but it, that, that works as well. I, I think that I didn't think of that to, to bring up, but I think that that's sufficient for right. you to explain what you, how you would respond to that. I'd really be interested to hear how you respond to that. How I would respond to something like that? I said, well, give me your justification. Give me your justification. Because I say it's not a reversible claim. People may claim it's a reversible claim, but it's not. Because I can say that God is a precondition for intelligibility, and I can show why that is the case. I can show why God is necessary for knowledge, why it's necessary for truth, why it's necessary for proof, why it's necessary for science, why it's necessary for morality. I can show all those things. Now, somebody might come back and say, no, not God is necessary for all those things. I say, the floor is yours. Okay, so that, that it doesn't it doesn't answer my my position as as well as I, as what I thought. So I'll, I'll just I'll continue. Mm -hmm. um, for the the type of knowledge that you are are talking about, for the type of intelligibility and truth and justification that you're talking about, all of that is from within your worldview. And to you, there are no other worldviews than yours and people who are fighting yours. But I don't hold that position. That's fine. I, I hold the position that every human being is flawed. Every human being has weaknesses. They, they fool themselves. They are capable of making mistakes and having false understandings. But the problem with that is... That doesn't mean that you aren't able to hold a true belief. That doesn't mean you, that you're not able of knowing what's true. That only means that you also have a margin for error in the fact that you are a flawed human being. Now, in your worldview, you also agree that every human being is flawed. Every human being has weaknesses and they are prone to mistakes, which is why you have the biblical God providing special revelation and the general revelation to overcome that. But here's so, the problem, though. Okay. I can make sense of that claim. You can't. Because the I thing is, of, you can make sense of what claim? I can make sense of the claim that everyone is flawed. I can make an absolute knowledge claim to the degree that everyone is flawed. But when you make that claim, you're coming from a perspective that is flawed. So my question is, how do you know anything? And this is how it goes. And I, we don't have to go down that line, but this is how it goes in a discussion if this was a debate. I say, how do you know anything to point zero 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 one percent about the nature of humanity? And it would have to be a vicious circle of of assuming the truth of what you do believe to conclude anything about any knowledge claim. The, the, the problem, I think, comes when you are assuming that the level of certainty that your worldview provides you is something that is relevant to everyone else. It's not a matter of whether or not, because you, you would agree that having knowledge and claiming knowledge are two different things. Absolutely. Having certainty and claiming certainty are two different things. Again, claims that I can justify. Right. Right. So the the operable, the functional level of knowledge is different from absolute perfect knowledge. 
And I would argue that having the absolute perfect knowledge is not necessarily relevant to a functional execution of living your life. My claim is that, you know, you say you have a functional level of knowledge. And, you know, I get Christians that criticize me for that as well because they say I talk about certainty all the time. But that's not my argument. My argument is that not that we all have certainty about everything or even something along that line. I'm saying that you cannot, as an unbeliever, have knowledge to any degree without begging the question. And I'm all ears as to how a person can have knowledge to any degree. Forget certainty. Because you say a functional level of knowledge. I'm interested. And, well, I mean, I'm interested in knowing how people can have knowledge to 0.001% unless they appeal to God. Okay. The problem is that the semantical issue of your worldview versus my worldview, you saying that there is this revelation from God. Right. That that is something that I can't comprehend. That just the fact that you are receiving the revelation, the claim that you're saying, I have received this, you have received this, everyone has received this. The reality of that statement is what I can't comprehend in the same way that you can't comprehend how I could have functional knowledge. Yeah, but the thing is... I don't know if I can explain it to you any more than you can explain to me that you have revelation. That's fair. That's fair. But I'm willing to listen to the attempt. What attempt? The attempt to explain how you can have knowledge to 0.001%. Now you're saying that I won't understand it. That's fine. Okay. All right. The 0.001% that you're talking about, I don't think that is relevant, right? We're not talking... That's just like an arbitrary number. Well, that's right. How can you have knowledge to any degree, functional, whatever, to any degree without God? Okay. So when babies come into the world... Right. When they're born, do they have knowledge? I'm not a psychologist. I don't know to what degree they have, but I would say that they have a knowledge of God. Okay. So when a baby is born, neurologists are saying, or neuroscientists, however you want to classify them, they're saying that babies don't reach a level of self-awareness until they're 18 months to two years old. When they can see themselves in a mirror, they've got a test they do where they put lipstick on the kid's face. I'm sure you're familiar with that. But it's 18 months or two years before a child is able to see that. But before that, they're already experiencing the world. They're already experiencing their parents, their surroundings, the dog, if there's one in the family. They're experiencing that before they have any understanding of epistemology, before they have any understanding of theology itself. They are already living their lives. So if I, in my worldview, I presuppose the physical world and whatever that entails, whatever parts of it that I don't understand are there, I presuppose that it is a fact, that it is something that does exist. I also presuppose that I exist in it, and so do you. Now, that to me is functional. That to me is satisfactory to live my life, to just say, I'm going to accept that these things exist. They are part of reality, and they don't necessarily require justification. Just accept that they're there. That's it. And I would say that a baby does the same thing. But here's the problem, though. You have no basis for claiming that you're in the right reality. What do you mean the right reality? Well, this is, I mean, the whole brain in the vat thing. You could be, you know, you could be a brain in a vat somewhere being fed with electrodes from something. Like, you're, right now, you could be mind controlled. Okay, but remember what I said about my presuppositions. Right, I realize that. I presuppose that the physical world, whatever it entails, exists, and I exist in it. Right, but you could be wrong about that. No, I can't, because I'm presupposing it, in the same way that you're presupposing God. But the thing is, you're not appealing to anything outside of your own brain in order to glean this knowledge. You're not appealing to anything outside that would have knowledge of everything. So for all you know, I mean, you presuppose that you're not a brain in a vat, but you could be. No, I'm not presupposing that. I just said, I presuppose the physical world, whatever it entails. Right. Whatever the true state of it is, that's what I presuppose. Right, however. And I presuppose that I exist in it. Right. And so do you. However, you could be wrong about that. Whatever the state of the physical world is, that's what I'm presupposing. Right. Well, the thing is, you could have, for instance, you could have a, you could be mind controlled. Would you not agree that that's a possibility? I could be mind controlled? Yeah. 
that you if can. The, I'm presupposing the physical world. So yes, that is if that is the true state of it, then that's the what that's what exists. But right. think of, you could be right now strapped down, face down to a, a bed right now with a you know electrodes feeding in your head for your entire life, and you could be imagining this conversation. You could be. This could all be an illusion for all you know. You could be imagining it. You're talking about solipsism now, right? Or are you talking about the matrix? Well, what there there could be a circumstance where your perception. Because the thing is, this is what unbelievers tell me all the time. That I go on my perception of reality. I say, how do you know it's the right reality? And they say, I don't. But I can only deal with what I'm dealing with. I've never heard that question before. How do you know it's the right reality? Right. Exactly. But I, that's, I don't think I understand what you mean by right reality. Well, the thing is, the brain and the vat scenario. That could be real, according to your worldview. It's a possibility. It could be the case that up is down, down is up, and you're just being fed this information, and you're just, you know, you're mind controlled. And really, from an evolutionary perspective, you know, really, I don't see any way out of determinism. That you're just saying these things based on the pizza you had last night, not based on I'm anything. Compatibilist. Compatible. That is another thing that I'd like to get into sometime as far as an, an, a professed atheist who is compatibilist, because I don't think that's possible. But anyhow, you would, you would agree that it's a possibility that there is a different reality. There's also a possibility in Russell's teapot, there's a possibility right. that, the, that the teapot is floating around. Okay, in space, right? But, but once That's you grant that, do, but it's it's not really worth. No, no. Here's the problem. Once you grant that, the only way out of that is with omniscience. I understand. And that's something that you can appeal to. Right. There, that being the case, you can't know anything to any degree. That depends. Okay, when you go from certainty of knowledge to not having any knowledge. I think that is the point in the discussion when a lot of non-believers are going to to not see the leap that you're okay, making. Okay, well, so well, could you could you sure. explain that, break that down, just for the sake of this discussion okay, this, this, of yeah. going from not having certainty of absolute knowledge with omniscience to not having any okay. knowledge at all. This is the example. I've been working on a scenario, and I say, imagine there's a mansion with a thousand rooms. In 999 of those rooms, the people in that room are strapped face down to a bed with electrodes feeding them impulses, feeding them their thoughts. And only in one of those rooms is the person have uh, proper cognitive faculties where he can actually see his surroundings, where he can know these things. Now, the question that I come up with is, if I'm having this discussion with you, what color are the walls in your room? And you say, they're blue. I say, how do I know that? Well, my, my eyes are telling me this. And everybody else in the room is telling me that the walls are blue in this room. And I say, wait a minute. How do you know that you're not in a room where you're strapped face down to a bed? You're not seeing anything. And the impulses you're getting from other people are just illusory. How do you know that you're not in that room? And that's the question. So I say, if there's all these different possibilities for reality, and I ask you any question, you say, well, within my reality, this is how I make sense of it. But you have to keep in mind that you could be in that room where you're being mind controlled, and it's just gibberish what you're saying. There's no appeal outside to, you know, to say the person who sees all these rooms who can make you certain of the fact that you're not in one of those rooms. And that's what the Christian appeals to. But when you say, well, I can only depend on what the cognitive faculties that I have, you could be in those one of those rooms where you're strapped face down to a bed being fed, you know, being fed thoughts in your brain. So I say, how do you know? And they say, well, I know to point zero 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 one percent that the walls in my room are blue. Well, in order to say that, you have to tell me that you're not in that room. And if you're in that room, and now the question is, how do I know that I'm not? In that? If I was in one of those rooms, I couldn't know it. The difference is, I can know that I'm not, based on revelation. And that is exactly the claim. Right. There. No, 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 okay, no, okay, so that's where the difference is. Well, let me go right. further with that. That's where the difference is. I claim that I can know that I'm not in one of those rooms by appealing to God. Now, I, uh, it's my claim that it would take sheer intellectual dishonesty to say that God cannot let you know for certain that you're not in one of those rooms. That's my if claim. If God exists. Pardon me. If God exists. Yeah, if God exists, he could let me know for certain that I'm not in one of those rooms. So I'm okay. saying that so is now, that I is the Christians... Sorry? So far, within your framework of what right. you just explained, 
uh, there is no way for me or you within that framework to know that we are not strapped face down in, in, okay. in the bed. So you would not within con- that framework. Right? So you would not concede. But now, now we come to the point where I have to be able to accept that what you say you can know puts you out of that room. Well, hang on a second. So are you saying that an all-knowing, all-powerful God could not let us know for certain that we are not in one of those rooms? So you're talking about um, uh, coherent philosophy? Like you're, you have a coherent explanation that gets you out of the room? No, no, no. I'm saying however God does it, he could not make us certain that we're not in one of those rooms? If he exists. Right. Okay. So my worldview, if God exists, gives me a justification for knowing I'm not in those rooms, knowing what color the walls are in my room, knowing all these other things. Now, my simple question is, what is your justification for knowing you're not in one of those rooms? What is my... Okay. The, the, the problem here, and I just explained, right. that within that framework, there's no way for either of us to make it out. Well, cre- I mean, let's stop there for a minute, because... You said, if God exists, I can know. If you want to attract that, if you want to attract that, that's fine. No, I'm, no, I, I don't want to. I don't okay, so according to my worldview, according to my worldview, where God exists, I can know that I'm not in one of those rooms. Whether that's the case or not, we can put on the back burner for now. According to my worldview, God exists, I can know I'm not in one of those rooms. Is that fair? If, yes, if your worldview is true. Right, that's, okay. That's the question. Okay, so... If my worldview is true, I can know that I'm not. How can you know that you're not? It's not a relevant question within my worldview. Okay, that's fine. What you're asking is not something that, that makes any sense or matters in my worldview. That's, see, that's the problem is you, you've stated that, that you can't fathom living in a world without, uh, without you know, the biblical God. But I can. That's right. So, so it makes sense to me in a context that it doesn't make sense to you. It's it's a semantic issue of the difference in our worldviews, and you are just asserting that there's no worldview except your own. But I have one. So as far as I'm concerned, it's just a different viewpoint that you have. And as I've already stated, if every human being is flawed, even what you think you know absolutely true, you could still be wrong. But the problem that's, that's is... something that I can't get over. Your problem is you're making claims about all the rooms. And I'm just asking you. Now you're saying it's an irrelevant question. It's not irrelevant to me. It's of vital importance no, to me. I understand it's not irrelevant to you. But right. it, it is irrelevant to me. That's, that's fine. So you don't care if you're strapped face down to a bed, being fed, being mind controlled. You don't care about that. It's irrelevant to you because this is all you have. This is all you got. I care about what's true. Right. But the thing is, in order to know what's true, you have to appeal to omniscience. No. Okay, well, no, tell me how... You... You. No, no, but the thing is, what is true, you could say, in that scenario, you could be strapped face down to a bed with an electrode, face down, and you say, I care about what's true. Now, somebody who's outside of that room says, that's ridiculous. How can you even make a claim about truth when you can't tell me if you're not in that state? And now you could say, well, I don't care if I know whether I'm in that state or not. And from me, from being outside of that state, well, that's where the conversation ends. But that's, it's also a claim to me that you are outside the room. Yeah, as but, far as I'm concerned, human beings, which I am and which you are, as I said in my worldview, I presuppose that the physical world exists. I am in it. So are you. And I'm not perfect. Well, this and I have no reason to think you're perfect either. You don't claim to be perfect. So therefore, you, are, you have limitations just like I do. So but the for thing you is, to make a claim of being able to do something that I can't do, I need justification to believe that. <laughs> but the thing is, you have to keep in mind that you could be saying all of these things out of your mouth from within one of those rooms where you're being mind controlled. Now here's what it boils down to. You say... I can know, if my worldview is true, I can know that I'm not one of those rooms. And I say, how can you know? And you say, it's irrelevant to me. And I say, well, thank you for your time. That's where the conversation ends. Because I don't think it's irrelevant to you. Because the thing is, you will make truth claims and you will make knowledge claims. And you say, well, that's within all I need. Within my worldview. Right. It's, in, within my wor- it's not within your worldview. It's a different context. Right. However, within your worldview, even within your worldview, Intellectually, on, into, intellectual honesty would force you to admit that you cannot know that you're in the right reality. 
if I were to apply the same standard of intellectual honesty, right. then I would not be able to take your claims seriously. That's fine, but you admitted that according to my worldview, I can know that I'm not in one of those rooms. No, I said if your God exists. Right. And well, according to my worldview, God exists. So according to my worldview, I can know that I'm not in one of those rooms. That that's let's let's clear that up too because whether or not you believe God exists doesn't make God exist. As I already Fair. said, if it, it it it's a different matter of claiming certainty and having right. certainty. However, right. according to my worldview, if God exists, which I think is a blasphemous hypothetical because God exists and you know it. However, that aside, if God exists and He's all knowing and all powerful. He can make me know for certain that I'm not in one of those rooms. If my worldview is true, I can know for certain that I'm not in one of those rooms. Is that fair? Right. So it's just a matter now, to me, of being convinced that the biblical God is the only thing that can possibly give knowledge. I can't convince you. And I will be happy to accept your worldview as true. Otherwise, to me, it it's unsupported. Well, the thing is, proof does not equal persuasion. Of the, of the absurdity of what you say about my worldview, it's still made from within your worldview. Well, here's the problem. Can you say, I can't be convinced that it's true? I need support. Sorry? I need... You, you, you lagged out there. Can well, you I'm that? saying that you say you can't be convinced it's true. First of all, I can't convince you. But when you assume such things as truth and such things as proof and, you know, and, and absurdity and all those things, you are doing that as though you can know you're not in one of those rooms. No, I'm not. Okay, then what is truth in your worldview? That which best adheres to reality. Okay. How do you know you're in the right reality? What other reality do I have any justification to assume exists? That's not what I'm asking. I'm not asking about what justification you have for knowing. I'm saying there is the possibility that there are other realities. You could be a brain in a vat. Certainly. Okay. How do you know that the reality, that you have your correspondence theory of truth, truth is that which corresponds to reality on a basic yes. level. Yes. In order to know that, you have to know that you're in the right reality. Is that not fair? Of course it's fair. Okay, and since you cannot know that you're in the right reality, you cannot demand truth. You cannot demand logic, you cannot demand these things, and you cannot, I'm you can say, but you can say I'm, I'm not persuaded demanding. of them, but you can say I'm, I'm not... I'm, I'm not demanding anything. No, I understand that, but you okay. can say I'm not persuaded of it. But to me, right. that's totally irrelevant, because if you can't, Justify that you're not in one of those rooms. The things you're asking assume that you're not in one of those rooms. And I'm saying you have no basis for that assumption. Zero. Okay. So th and then we're back to the point of functionality. What functional level, what, how, what functionality is there in assuming that I am in one of those rooms? Well, I'm, I'm saying that even that question assumes that you're not. And that's why I say... Anything outside of God is absurd. From him, through him, and to him are all things. So when you ask a question, you already do it on the basis that you're not in one of those rooms because you are trying to know what you were trying to know what I said. You're trying to judge the truth of what I said. You're trying to uh, um, see whether it's logical. You're assessing all that. Because let's say I said to you, okay, purple penguins sleep fast under the West. You say, hey, wait a minute. I'm asking a serious question here. I want to know how I can know, you know, why it's functional, you know, why it's even necessary for me to posit these things. And I say, okay, purple penguins sleep fast under the West. And you say, no, 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 that's not an answer. I say, how do you know? <laughs> how do you know that that's not an answer in your worldview? I'm saying that when you demand all of these things, this functionality, any of those, those things borrow from a claim from the knowledge that you're not in one of those rooms. There are operable assumptions that people make to live their lives. They are based on becoming aware of the world that we already live in when we're babies. So you build a worldview as you develop, as you grow up. You build a worldview to make sense using reason and logic of the world around you. Would you agree? I would agree with that, but that only makes sense in my worldview. Okay, that's because you've already stated that you can't fathom any other worldview except your No, own. that's not why. That's not why, not because I can't fathom it, because of what God says. And okay. as I've demonstrated that my worldview, as you've agreed, I can know that I'm not in one of those rooms. If my worldview is true. No, I have not. I have not. You said if my worldview is true, I can know that I'm not in one of those rooms. 
No, I didn't say that. I said that if the biblical God exists, right, then you could know that. Well, if my worldview is true, you believe it is is irrelevant. No, if my worldview is true, I said. If your worldview is true, true, then I can know that I'm not in one of those rooms. If it were true, right, that's always going to be the problem. Well, Anytime you talk to a non-believer, that's fine. That's fair. To a non-believer, that's going to be the problem. Is yeah. getting to the point of accepting that what you're saying makes any <laughs> sense to us. But I'm not trying to get you to accept it. And what I'm saying is that when I say if my worldview is true, I can make sense of things. And you say, well, that doesn't make sense to me. I say, fine. Tell me how you can make sense of things when you can't know if you're in the right reality. But you are I, me telling you in the conversation. Right. That's the problem. If you can't relate to my worldview, there's no way for me to explain it to you in a way that you're going to understand because okay. you have a different presupposition. That's, that's the problem. Yeah, but the thing is, if you cannot recognize that you have to know that you're in the right reality, that's a difficulty. And if you say, well, Sai, you cannot see that that's not a difficulty, I say, fine. Then it was nice talking with you. But the thing is, I think that, I think that nice you, you, you would have no, to reflect. I've, I've enjoyed this. Yeah. I have to tell you, it's, it's been a good conversation. Yeah, I think so, too. But, but that's the, something that, and, you know, sometimes I get frustrated in the fact that people cannot see it. I cannot make you see it. And you could say the same thing about me. I grant that. I right. grant that. But if somebody has a correspondence theory of truth, truth is that which corresponds to reality, and I say, well, how do you know what's real? And I say, that's just irrelevant. It doesn't, it doesn't matter to me. This is all I have to work with. I say, well, fine, you can say that. And if that satisfies you to make claims about truth, and, and when you have a correspondence theory of truth, that satisfies you, that's fine. It just, I see a great there's, difficulty with that. And there's, there's one, other, one other problem here. Is mm -hmm. when, within your worldview, as far as you're concerned, I know that your worldview is true. Yes. And therefore, I am operating under not just con confusion, but deception. Self-deception. And that, I, I would argue that that prejudices you against any other world. Based on your limitations as a human being, it prejudices you against people presenting other worldviews if you're automatically assuming that they're not correct. Well, let, let, me, let, me, let me word this a different way. I know that 2 plus 2 is 4. And you're saying, well, that automatically prejudices you against anybody who comes up and says 5 or 7 or 9. Yes, it does. But if it's the right answer, then it's a, it's a valid prejudice. It's also demonstrable. Well, I would say it's demonstrable too. By the impossibility of the contrary. That I say I can have truth and I can have knowledge according to my worldview. And then when you claim these things, you can't. It's just not, it's meaningless to you. It's irrelevant to you. That's fine. But where you get to truth from there, that's what I'd like to know. And you can say, well, within my worldview, fine. But you could be strapped face down to a bed within your worldview. And if you want to say, I can know true things within that, that's fine. If that's how you want to live. But I'm saying that there's an accountability for that. Because this is how I describe it to people. I say, look, I can go on to Crown land. In Canada, that's what the Crown land is, you know, government old land. And I can shoot deer. I can kill them. I can clean them. I can cook them. And I can eat them. I can do all those things. Say, look, I don't have to know that somebody owns this land. I can do all these things. But the problem is somebody does own that land. And I'm saying that when you do these things, when you demand truth from the, uh, the, the Christian, when you demand you know, uh, evidence, or, okay, I grant that, you know, you're just asking these questions. But when you even ask those questions, you're doing that on crown land. And there will be an accountability for that. That when you stand before God, you'll say, you know, I have made myself abundantly clear to you for your entire life. You've done all these things. You've had this conversation with this, you know, with these Christians. And, and that's why I say this is not just a fun philosophical argument. I, re I realize you disagree with my worldview. But if you don't repent and put your trust in Jesus Christ, this is bad news for you because you've been given more truth than the next guy hasn't been. And people are judged according to the amount of truth they get and reject. And that's why I would urge you that if you plan on dying unrepentant, that you don't do these hangouts anymore because it won't be good for you because you get a lot of truth that the next person doesn't get. And I'm just saying that I'm not a hell and fire and brimstone type of person, but the thing is I urge you, I urge you, to repent and put your trust in Jesus Christ because I would not want to be responsibility for a, a more severe punishment for you by explaining the truth. And I understand that you don't agree, but it's something that I must voice because there is hope. There is hope. And I know that you yeah. do that out of love. Mm -hmm. I understand. I do. But 
I, I have heard all of this before. I, that's and right. I am, I am trying to figure out what's true. And that, like I said in the Hangout the other night with, with, with Tim and Len and all of the others, mm -hmm. If I, if I, well, just give me the benefit of, a devout, uh, of the doubt, just for a thought experiment. Okay. That Dustin is right, and I've suppressed my, my knowledge of God so deeply that I don't, I'm not aware of it. Right. So, what tools do I have to then come to the conclusion, if I can at all, that the biblical God is the only justification for knowledge? You can't. You can't. Then you that's have, my problem. You have to read your Bible and you have to pray. And you're talking you, about acceptance of something to be true without using rationality. I don't no, 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 I'm not doing that at all. Because I'm saying you cannot rationalize to the truth of the Bible. My Bible says a donkey talked. My Bible says a donkey talked. My Bible says a man who was dead for three days came back to life. You cannot rationalize to the truth of that. Right. But you need to read it in the hope that God opens your eyes. Now, if you say, I don't care. I don't care that I spend an eternity in torment. I don't care. And I say, well, then don't read your Bible. And I, I participate I, in these discussions. Right, I understand that. I, I do care. I, I care about what's true. Yeah, well, and then. I'm using the tools that I know how to use in the most productive way that I know how to do. Right. All right, I'm trying right. to do that. But if you're asking and for advice. That you're right. giving me, based on those limitations, I can't accept. That's fine. Well, if you're asking me for advice what you should do, I would say read your Bible. And if you say, well, I can't accept those limitations, then I say, well, I'll pray for you, and I hope that you do someday, but I hope you don't get by a bus tonight, you know, because that won't be good for you. Now, I'm just saying well, that's... I hope you don't get hit by... Yeah, but the thing early. is, for me, that's victory. For me, it's victory. <laughs> Death is victory for a Christian. Life is a gift, and I, and I love every moment that I have. But I tell you, seven years ago, I was on an operating table. They took my appendix out. And there was some complication in a couple of days later, they actually had to put the paddles on me to zap my heart out of a, it wasn't a, a life-saving thing, but it was to correct a rhythm. And that, that shock could have killed me. And they told me two hours before that procedure that they were going to zap my heart. And I, um, I think that's probably the two most peaceful hours I've spent in my entire life. Certainly that week in the hospital, knowing that I could be dead in two hours and with my maker. Now you might say that's all illusion based on your, that's fine, but I'm giving you a testimony of what it was like when death for me was imminent. And the doctor said, this can kill you, it can give you a stroke. And I said, I don't care, I'm not afraid to die. Now, you could say, well, that's a placebo, whatever, but I'm just telling you from personal experience that there was a chance that I would be dead in two hours. And it was the two most peaceful hours I spent in my life. I, I am not afraid of the either. Okay, well then I would say, if you're not afraid if you're not concerned about where you will spend oh, eternity. It's different. It's concerned because okay. I have responsibilities, but being having fear is a different No, matter. but if you're not concerned where you will spend eternity, then I can't even convince you to read your Bible. It's a question of whether or not eternity is a relevant topic. Right. However, of the two of us, if my worldview is true, I'm speaking from an angle where I can tell you that it is relevant. And the difference is that you, again, back to that room scenario, cannot know that you're not in one of those rooms. And you're saying, well, you know what? Eternity, it's not really an issue for me. I say, well, I'm sorry, I can't help you. So if I'm understanding you, the, the real issue for you is certainty that you're not in one of those rooms. I'm saying that if one does not start there, then one cannot make sense of any word that comes out of their mouth, not only any word, but any thought in their heads. The it seems like too too big of a leap. Well, well, let me let me let me explain that for you. It forgoes, it forgoes the functional aspect. Well, well, let me let me let me explain that for you. When I say you can't make sense of one word that comes out of your mouth, when you assume that the words you're about to speak mean the same thing they did five seconds ago, you're you're depending on the inductive principle, yes. the uniformity of nature. But you cannot make that assumption if you can't know you're not in one of those rooms. Why not? What's the basis for it? We're dealing with probabilities, not absolute certainty. Yeah, That's but probability, you're dealing with the absolute certainty of probability. The law of probability. You're, that's, you cannot that's, escape it. That's, that's how we live our lives. If I know that I'm supposed to look each way when I cross the street, and I don't one day, right. and I get hit by a car, then the probability of me looking both ways before I cross the street, that has served me well and failed me when I stopped using that 
re re relying on that uh, right. probability. Right? However, so I have justification to go to to live my life based on probability, and even if I don't know absolutely certain, as you claim to, that yes. certain parts of your worldview are true, I'm still justified in living my way, my life, based on some probabilities, my personal experience. Okay, back to the room scenario. When you say that, you could be strapped face down to a bed, being fed these thoughts, and you're saying all these things about cars and about knowing and about induction and stuff like that, when all of it could be just data that's filtered into your brain. So, you know, of course, God has given us induction. He's given us that type of reasoning. I can make sense of that in my worldview. God who controls the universe. But if somebody is, cannot know that it, then in, they're in the right reality, they cannot make sense of inductive reasoning. They cannot make sense of science. They cannot make sense of logic. You say, well, functionally, I can. I say, but functionally, you can within that room. But you don't know if that's the right room. You could be in that room where, where nothing makes sense. The problem that we keep coming back to, though, is that you're not able to comprehend where we're coming from. From your worldview, we are lying in a way, well, we're being deceptive, we're, we're suppressing our right. So how can you understand our worldview in its context if but, you can only see our worldview as a distortion of your own? Okay, but the thing is, it's not a matter of understanding your worldview. I ask a question regarding your worldview. My question is, how do you know you're not in one of those rooms? And your question to me is that that's irrelevant. That And now the problem is, you're saying that I cannot understand, I cannot fathom that you are in a position where you say it's irrelevant. You're right, I can't. But your answer still is that that's irrelevant. Well, it's, it, I'm, I'm reminded of the example you gave when you were talking to him. Was that right. his name? Mm -hmm. Talking about the man who's about to stab a child in the chest, and right. it turns out that it's a surgeon. That's, right. just, that's the context I think that you're missing, is the difference between um, something that uh, is beneficial and something that's not. Right. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what is the beneficial uh, end of having absolute certainty about not being the the, the brain in the vat. Because then and you just can... accepting that it's it's a hypo, it's, you know some hypothetical. I also accept as a hypothetical that your God exists. However, I accept as a hypothetical that uh, that Hinduism is. There's a and and then I have to evaluate those based right. on the reasoning that I have. Right? right. But the problem is, it all comes back to the fact that if you can't know you're not in that room, anything out of your mouth is nonsensical within your worldview. Well, and again, you say you cannot know, and your definition of truth is truth is that which corresponds to reality. Yes. And correct me if I'm wrong, but you're saying you cannot know what the right reality is. We're still Can't. talking about probabilities. Yeah, but you cannot know that you're in the right reality. You're talking about certainty though, right? Well, you cannot know to any degree that you're in the right reality. That doesn't necessarily follow from knowing something. But you cannot know to any degree that you're in the right reality. Is that not within fair? Within worldview, you make it makes sense within my worldview okay. to have knowledge and not be 1,000% no. certain of it. My question is, since truth is that which corresponds to reality, knowledge must yes. be true, how do you know to 1% that you're in the right reality? That depends on how you're defining knowledge. Well, how do you define knowledge? A justified true belief. Okay, now you would admit that it's possible that you're not in the right reality. That what you're talking about is not the right reality, that it's that's a fabrication. With you, the, possi the, the caveat that the possibility is so small it's not even worth considering. Yeah, but the thing is... I have no reason to think that's true. Just like I have no reason to think that your worldview is true and I'm actually wrong. Now, it doesn't matter to me... Oh, hold on a second. I'll, Sean, I'll read what you wrote in just a minute. Um, it, oh, I just lost my, my train of thought. Um, it doesn't matter to you, something along that line. Uh, I, I forget it. it, it mm -hmm. but, we're, we're, we're talking past each other because right. we have such differing worldviews. That's the problem. And, <laughs> and from, from my perspective, when you explain your worldview in such a way that mine is absurd, I have the same position about yours. However, that's the problem here. Is however, we're both human beings with limitations. Yeah. So I don't have any reason to see that your your explanation is also my explanation, and I'm just mis I'm just confused. But here's the difference. What's okay, that? Go on. The difference is that you've conceded that according to my world, I can know things to be true. If my worldview is true, I can know things to be true. 
Now you talk about truth, but truth makes no sense in a worldview where you cannot know that you're in the right reality. It makes no sense. Well, you can appeal approaching this from a different direction. Okay. Because within your worldview, I also have your worldview. So I can also know things to be true. Right. I mean, within my worldview, I can know things to a reasonable degree of certainty about them being true. So in both of our worldviews, yours and mine, okay. I can know things. Well, let me ask you this question. So it's just a matter of accounting within your understanding of theology well, that, for right. where that comes from. Let you me ask you this. Knowledge, I grant myself knowledge. Therefore, in both worldviews, I have knowledge. It's just a matter of having an explanation that satisfies you from within the worldview okay. that you admit is not able to relate to mine within context. That's, That's fair. That's my problem. That's fair. Now, let me ask you this question. When you say that truth is that which corresponds to reality, is it important to know which is the right reality? To which degree of certainty? To any degree. I have a degree of certainty. And that's not what I'm asking. The question is, is it important to know that you're in the right reality to any degree? In order to come Within to... my capabilities as a human being, yes. It is. Okay, now it is important to know that. And now within when my, I ask you... With the caveat, within my limitations... Is right, within being. your limitations, it's important to know that. Fine. Now when I ask you, how do you know you're in the right reality? You can't tell me. Now I'm showing that that is a problem with your worldview. I, I, I understand, but we're talking... Question of no. That's Sorry, you, you broke up there. I'm not claiming truth about my knowledge. I'm claiming that it's justified for me to believe something is true. Yeah, but the thing is, and you're using is words truth. Abilities. That's that's based on induction. Is based on how I've lived my life up to this right. point. Right. But these are all truth claims, and the concept of how truth that, that. Okay. If if I can't justify to you within your worldview that what I believe is true actually is true. Okay. Then, and I can't justify it to myself within your worldview. That I would argue is a limitation of your worldview for understanding other worldviews in context, especially if you're assuming at the outset that I'm just wrong, no matter what I say. Well, let's recap. Truth is as corresponds to reality. I'm asking you whether it's important that you know that you're in the right reality, and you say within your limitation, yes, it is important. And yes, then the next right. question is, how do you know that you're in that right reality? And that's when you answer, well, that's really an irrelevant question to me. And I think I've exposed the fact that it is relevant to you to know that you're in the right reality if truth is that which corresponds to reality. Right, within my capacity to know as a limited right. human being, and which I, you also are. Well, the thing is, my question to you is according to your worldview, how do you know to any degree that you're in the right reality? I think that we're we're just going to end up talking in circles at this point. Yeah, I think it's a valid. Is that not a valid question, though? It is a valid question. I've already answered it. Well, I, I'm sorry. I, I don't think you have, because you're okay. appealing so to. If, if you don't think I have, then then please repeat it for me so that I can answer it. How do you know that you're not? How do you know that you're in the right reality? And your answer always has been appealing to things within that reality. Right. But the thing is, that is not. So, I ask, how do you know you're not face down, strapped to a bed with these electrodes in your head? And you say, well, because of the things I see, because of the walls, or because these people are telling me this because I'm doing all these things. I say, wait a minute, those are all things that could be contained within the false reality. Yes. So you need something external to be able to communicate to you that you are not in a false reality. Except, as I said earlier in our discussion, that I presuppose the physical world, however it manifests, that I exist in it, as do you. Right. So to your me, presupposition that could is be what is true. Right. To you, but that's arbitrary, and it could be right. false. Your, your claims of absolute certainty coming from God through general revelation and special revelation is the same. Well, right. Here. No, the difference is you've conceded that according to my worldview, I can know that I'm not in one of those rooms. Does that make it true, though? Well, I'm showing. I'm just showing the difference between the worldviews. That You're my worldview coherence of it, but that doesn't make the, it a true explanation. Well, the problem is that that is my worldview conceded the possibility of it. Now, everything out of your mouth assumes that you're not in one of those rooms, and you have yet to tell me how you cannot, how you can know that you're not in one of those rooms. Because I can't, and I have said I don't think you can either. Well, then you're contradicting what you've conceded. 
No, I'm not. Okay. I'm talking about the existence of the biblical God. Right. Versus what you believe to be true. Right. That is the problem. If it's God exists, if my world of view is true, I can have knowledge. Right, but does that mean that you have the, the correct understanding of the biblical God? That's well, I'm saying thing. that your question assumes that I do. I, I don't I don't follow. Can you explain? Because me? your question assumes truth. It assumes knowledge. It assumes logic, which cannot be made sense of in a world where you cannot know if you're in the right reality. That, again, depends on the presuppositions that we're coming from. It's a semantic issue. Well, I don't believe I it's a that, semantic issue. What's that? I don't believe it's a semantic issue. I know, you don't, because you also don't believe that I, anything that I'm saying is what I actually think. But I'm, I'm just confused and I'm... No, I, I don't know how far you suppress the truth. I don't know, because the thing is, I'm also trying to convince you of things when I know that I can't. I know that I can't. I can't convince you of anything. I can just lay it out, hopefully, you know, that by the work of the Holy Spirit that he'll, you know, that these things will plague you, you know, until you find peace, until you find the Prince of Peace. You know, because the thing is, let's face it, consistent atheists aren't doing these hangouts. What do you mean consistent atheists? Because, I mean, this is the question that I ask you. I say, you're not out on arguing with Santa Claus at the mall as to, you know, why you're deceiving all these children, you know. You know. But the thing is, you come talk to a Christian, it, it doesn't make sense to me why anybody would be even concerned with what, why, what I believe if it's just some hypothetical, you know, variation of, you know, a possible other worldview where this might exist. Why waste your time? Okay. All right. That's a, that's a fair question. Um, the reason is that I don't care what people believe. I only care when they start to tell other people why they're wrong. And Strong within that. their worldview, they're even lying. That, see, that that to me is the, the real issue with your apologetic, is that you're assuming that people are lying. Okay, now, and I know that makes sense within your wor worldview, but to, to the rest of us, it sounds like you're just being antagonistic. But too many people, and just let me apologize for those presuppositions who hear this apologetic and they go, oh, you're lying when you say you don't believe in God. and Because then you're talking about something that's above my pay grade, first and second order beliefs. But scripture does not call the person a liar. It's a truth suppressor. So I don't call you a liar. I understand that's offensive. And I don't know to the degree, I don't know how truth suppression works. I don't have to okay. know. That was my next question. Maybe yeah. you could explain that. I don't know how it works. I have no idea. The example that Bonson gives is um, a woman who's uh, a single mother, has a kid that goes to school. And, and, you know, the kid's in the school, and the principal calls, your son's a little thief. She says, not my little Johnny, he's a saint. Calls a week later, your son's a little thief. He's stolen something again. Pulls him out of that school, sticks him in another school, and uh, the, pr the principal and a week later says, we caught your son stealing, he's a little thief. Oh, you were talking to the other principal, you have it out for my little boy. Pulls him out of that school. But the problem is, at home, she never leaves her purse unattended with her son. Now, on some degree, she believes that her son is a little saint, because she's seen the good qualities in him. And she understands that if she believes that her son is a little thief, it reflects poorly on her. Now, she elevates the belief where her son is a little saint. And she suppresses the belief where her son's a little thief. Is she lying when she says that her son is a, a, a saint? No, because she's elevating that belief which she wants to be true. And she's, she's suppressing... She's consciously aware that she's hiding her purse, well, isn't she? That's right, to whatever degree. However, while she's doing that, she's still elevating that other belief. And she's suppressing the truth. Now, Bonson did his doctoral dissertation on truth suppression. I've never seen it yet, but if you could track that down... I think it'd be a fascinating read. That's what he did a doctoral dissertation on. Well, if 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 what you're saying, all of what you're saying is true, then that has to be the case for me because I honestly don't see God, the biblical God. I don't see that as true anywhere. Right. I just see people claiming that it's true. Right, but when you make that claim, you borrow from the truth of the worldview where he exists. Now... It might take someone like me to explain that to you. And like I said, that will not reason you into the kingdom. I cannot reason you into the kingdom. But you can say, I do not see that. I don't see, and I say, every one of your words assumes it, whether you see it or not. Okay, let me, let me address that. Okay. Um, according to what we've learned through paleontology and, and DNA, the, the hum, human beings have been on Earth for at least um, a quarter of a million years. If the biblical God... If the Bible was written four to five thousand years ago, then all of those people were living before that, 
as just human beings experiencing a world. And there was no Bible for them to get the revelation from. Therefore, the existence of human beings predates the writing of the Bible. Now, if you take the, the position that the, the Bible is 100% true in everything it says, that's a different matter. But if you look at it as a historical perspective of when the Bible can be traced to be written and the historical data, the evidence of humans living much longer on Earth, then it follows that people came first and the Bible came later. Okay, two things. That's my worldview. Right, two things. The first thing is, you're making claims as though you're not in that room, one. And the second thing is, I believe that the Bible is true when it talks about Earth age. And don't get me wrong, if, if somebody said 10 years ago that the Earth is 6,000 years ago, I would have thought they were nuts. I, thought they, I would have thought they were loopy. Don't get me wrong. I would think it was absurd. I, call, I consider myself in that camp since I've been a presuppositionalist. Now, I don't normally explain this to uh, people who do not profess belief, but I'm going to help you. Uh, I'll explain to you how I see the age Earth issue. Okay. And there are people like Hugh Ross, for instance, who's a, creation, who's a, a, a Christian. He believes in billions of years. Hugh Ross believes that Adam was created as a man. He believes in a creation account. He does not believe in the evolution of the species. He believes that Adam was created as a man some 6,000 years ago, what have you. That being the case, this is the question that I would ask Hugh Ross. If there was a medical doctor present when Adam was created, and he said, okay, doctor, examine this man one second after he was created to tell me his age. He'd take out a measuring tape, measure his femur. This man has a femur the length of a 17-year-old man. He'd cut him open. He says he has organs the size of a 17-year-old man. He has sufficient bacteria in his body. I've measured them to digest the food of a 17-year-old man. He would have physical evidence that this man is 17 years old. And the question is, how old is he? He'd be one second old. So even if the dating methods were accurate, even if they were accurate, and a lot of them are woefully inaccurate, but even if they were accurate, how do you know that they're measuring real age as opposed to apparent age? It's my view that God created the universe mature in order to sustain life. Now here's the question. If you cut down a tree in the Garden of Eden, would it have tree rings? I have no idea. I don't know. I don't care. Now, are tree rings necessary for them to be strong in a strong wind? Sure they are. You know, I'm sure that that's helpful. I don't know. I'm not a... You know, I'm not, I, whatever they call them, I'm not a botanist. I don't know. I, if, I have no idea. So, but no the thing idea. is, let's say that tree rings are necessary for strength. Could God create a tree with rings in it? Sure he could. That's not an issue with me. My ultimate authority is scripture. And I'm willing to face my God with the most plain, with the most clearest reading of scripture that that's what I believe. And I can account for that by saying, look, if God created this mature, you have no way of saying that those dating methods are actually accurate. And, there's, and I can be an evidentialist and say, well, there's lots of things that show a young earth. You know, there's carbon and diamonds and things like this that shouldn't be there, yada, yada, yada. But people evaluate all of those things according to their presuppositions. That's why I don't debate evidences. All right. Um, okay. So, from what I understand, you were a Christian before mm -hmm. you developed this argument, right? What, about the age earth thing? No, no, your, your, your form of... I didn't uh, develop the argument. Was that? I didn't develop it. No, I, I know you didn't develop it, but you formulated it in the, the way that's become so popular, right? Well, I, I, the thing is, there's a fellow, um, Gene Cook Jr., I used to listen to his podcast, and I listened to some of the old ones, and I hear he never, he often does not focus on knowledge. I've never heard him do that. He focuses on stuff like logic. But it's far more difficult for me to sit here and show you the logic of the the law of excluded middle in scripture or the law of non-contradiction in scripture it's possible there's people dr james anderson who's done that who's taken biblical verses where we could derive the logical laws from scripture that's more difficult so that's where a lot of times where these people will go however you know i talked to gene last week i was out in california he fully agrees with where I, it's much easier to explain knowledge from scripture the fear of the lord is the beginning of knowledge all the treasures of wisdom knowledge are in jesus christ so that's what i stick with I said, that's what the Bible says. Now, you might think I'm a freak. This is what I say when I'm on the street. You might think I'm crazy for saying that. But then the next question is, where do you get knowledge without God? And knowledge, loosely defined, justified true belief. I understand there's different definitions with warrant and stuff like that. But loosely, something to be known must be true. And I said, what is truth? And most people will give me a correspondence theory of truth. Truth is that which corresponds to reality. How do you know what's real? I said, I can't know what's real. I said, well, then the whole thing crumbles. And then I say, according to my worldview, 
The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. According to my worldview, that makes sense. So you, you claim things to be true. You know things. You get in your car. You drive on the right side of the road. You drink. All these things that do not make sense in a world where you cannot have truth, cannot have knowledge. Okay. So I, I think it, I, we've reached the point now mm -hmm. where anything that we say is just going to be repeating. That's fair. Uh, what we've already said. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'd be happy I, if... I, I don't, I don't want to... I don't want to waste your time. Oh, I no, that's fine. I, I, I appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to talk to me. Mm -hmm. And I don't uh, mind, um, you know, in a in a hang in a talk like this to discuss any things about Christianity that people might. As you heard with that young fellow too, we talked about stuff that way off off the table that I normally discuss within the public exchanges with atheists. But if you have an issue with certain things about God's predestination stuff like that, happy to explain it to people in certain contexts. I will not go on the place and explain predestination to people. I wouldn't ask you to do that. No, no, I understand that, but I'm just telling you, you know, that I will, I will explain these things in a certain context for people that are interested in actually learning about these things. I am. Not, I'm very interested. Right. So very, very interested in all no, this. I, 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 I sense that. So if you ever want to ask about stuff like that, I'm more than happy to do that. Will I go would on you, a? Would you mind if I leave you as a contact on Skype? Oh no, that's fine. That's fine. I'd be happy to discuss these things with you. And like I say, if and there will be times in your life when you're at your end. I mean, just mentally, emotionally, psychologically, whatever. You might say that, that will never happen. Well, reach out to Sean. Reach out to myself. And if there comes a time when you want us to pray for you, and we'll do that anyways, I'm sure we will do that. But I just want you to know that there is hope out there. And, and we do this because we love you. I know it doesn't come across that way. I know when I'm out in the street it doesn't come across that way. Because, but I do this because I love people. And I'm firm in my beliefs, and I'm strong in my beliefs, and sometimes it does come across as unloving, and that's something I need to repent of, but that's the only reason I do this. So if there ever comes a time that you want to reach out, feel free to contact me, and I'm sure Sean would say the same thing. I appreciate that. All right. I appreciate that, because even if I don't agree that what you're trying to do is help necessarily, I mm -hmm. know that's how it's intended, right. and I, I respect that. I respect that all of you guys are trying so hard to help people, even if I don't agree with the way that you're doing it. Mm -hmm. And to me, intention is extremely important. And so and, I, I, I appreciate that. And, and also, it's important for me, if you see something I've done that you think is particularly unloving, I would urge you to tell me. I don't only want to hear that from Christians, because I'm not beyond correction. If an unbeliever says, sight, when you said this, so, I mean, feel free also to contact me along that line, too, because I want to. I would, I would just give one small comment okay. on that. Um, the way that you've talked to me and the way that you've answered my questions is much different than I've heard you talk to a lot of other people. Right. And as I said to Tim and Len and Sean the other night, this sort of discussion is much more likely to sway someone to listening to your opinion, even if they don't believe you, they're they're more likely they're going to be more receptive to this right. than the combative kind of approach. Right. That's that would be my only um, critique. But that goes, you know, what that goes for atheists too. Right. Atheists are just as much of a problem as uh, Christians are, or, or Muslims right. are, or whoever. That's the problem: is trying to come at it from a, 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 a debate or or argumentative position instead of trying to figure out what the other person is saying. Right. But the thing is, you have to keep in mind, most of my conversations are like this. It's the very few that aren't like this that make it onto YouTube. And and again, I go back to my analogy. Somebody comes up and says, I think your wife is a whore. That's when they get me. They're saying, your God does not exist. And I'm a, I'm a proponent of atheism, and I'm going to sway these people. I'm ahead of one of my groups. You know, I'm ahead of this, you know, uh, the elephant in the room thing. And I'm going to have atheistic watchers, you know, watch me dismantle this presupposition so that people can be uh, comforted in their lack of belief in God. Then I'm not going to have a nice discussion. Then I'm going to say, okay, wait a minute. You're the head of your group, and there is a place for righteous mockery in Scripture. I mean, Elijah reserved that for the prophets of Baal, for instance, when they, he said, call down fire upon this, upon this altar, and they couldn't do it. And he says, where's your God? Is he on the toilet? They've cleaned that up in Scripture to say, you know, is he, is he busy? But the Hebrew euphemism is, is he on the toilet? There is a place for that. And, I re and I'm not sanctified enough. I don't think that, you know, to engage in that. And I'm upset when Christians do engage in it. But if I'm going to engage in it, it's going to be in a place where someone who mocks 
the God that I adore, who goes on and does stuff like that, then I will engage him in that fashion. Whoever somebody wants to have a, a nice conversation about Christianity, I'd be happy to do that in this context. But I will not have this conversation on your show. I will not have this conversation. On, I'm glad that Dustin, who seems to be more sympathetic, he was on the show a couple of days ago. I don't know if you watched that one. With, I did. Yeah. Very. I won't have a discussion like that. And I actually talked to Dustin today. I talked to him a couple of days ago as well. And we see the differences in approach. And, um, you know, and like I said, it's like a good cop, bad cop thing. And I think that he, he disagrees with that type of analogy. But, um, you know, I don't know. He's just at that place now where he will have those discussions publicly. I won't. Will I have it with somebody new? Perhaps. But specifically with the relation with the New Covenant group, I'm not interested. If you are apart from them and you want to have this type of discussion publicly, I'd say, all right, that'd be fine. But as part of that New Covenant group, when they've, first of all, they told me that my argument was nonsensical. And then now they've spent like three or four shows, two hours long, talking about my argument. You know, just exposing the fact that if it's such nonsensical, they could just brush it off. You know, and then saying very unkind things about me in the process. You know, and I'm just not interested in having a civil discussion with those people. I'm interested in exposing the problem with their worldview, if that would be the case. So. Okay. But it was nice to meet yeah. you. It's nice to meet you too. I don't think we've spoken face to face like this no. before. So. I it's have nice. seen some of it's your nice comments. To, to be that? honest, when when uh, when I found out it was you, when you added me to Skype, I thought, oh, I thought it was just some person like that young fellow that was talking, who was open, who was not just looking for a, a, a weak underbelly. And then when I saw that it was you, from the comments that I read, I thought, oh, here we go. But I appreciate that. I, I think that it went. It was a good discussion, and I still I understand that you're. Uh, you're solid in your views, and you know we'll pray for you, and we'll hope that uh, God will work on your heart, and we'll see where it goes. And I understand; I have no reservations about you talking about this discussion on your show. You be, I mean, you have carte blanche to talk about what we talked about here. Don't you know? Don't don't feel that I have a certain level of privacy about that. Like, go ahead and talk about it on your show. That's fine. If you want to eviscerate, it, if you want to talk, that's fine. I don't have any problem with that. I have no intention of, of doing a show on this or anything. Right, but just so you know that if you get into a conversation, you are free to refer to this conversation. I'm, I'm not I'm not holding you to uh, secrecy on this conversation. Let's just put it that way. Okay. Um, that that's Sean was just she he um, gave a link of the truth suppression from Bonson and said before we close, can you both address the rights to use this audio? On YouTube, etc., so there are no misunderstandings. But did you record it? I, I have recording software. Yes, I did record it. Okay. Well, and yeah, I, I think Sean you let you know that I recorded. Ask me not to use it, I won't use it. Um. Well, I don't. I don't know. Um. I don't like the association with the New Covenant group. I would say if you're going to share it, you can share this um, in a format that's not associated with them. Okay. I have my own YouTube channel just okay. for myself. That's not associated with them. Okay, that would be fine. fine. That would be fine. And um, you know, hopefully that you will maintain the same tone after this is released. And uh, because the thing is, if you put it out there and you say, "Well, I had these conversations with these two idiots," and yada yada, then I think that would be disingenuous. But if you just want it as something to share with your friends and stuff like that, as a good conversation between an atheist and a Christian, I'd be happy. I doubt your channel. There's there's no reason for you to be aware of it, but mm -hmm. I have mirrored things from Matthew 419 as well mm -hmm. in in their entirety, unedited with no commentary or anything like that. That's all I would do with this. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Great. Thank well, it was you. nice meeting you. You too, and you have a good night. You too. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye.